again, appreciate so much for the opportunity to be here and to talk about this subject that is something that is really, really important to me. Uh, burnout is something that is affecting lots of people. And in fact, 52% of workers surveyed in this last year say that they feel burnt out. This is according to Indeed's latest workplace burnout prevention survey. 27% say that they can't disconnect from work when they're at home. And another 38% say that potentially more time off from work can help. Now, I know that this has been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic, but this has been a rising trend for years, not just in the last couple of years. It seems like every couple of weeks I'm seeing a new Twitter post, a new blog post from someone that's saying, hey, I'm feeling burnt out and I'm quitting my job. I'm doing something radically different. I remember this tweet that I saw from someone that said, I'm quitting my software engineering job to detail cars. Now, I think it's awesome that people are recognizing this state in their lives. I think it's great they're seeking help and they're making radical changes to get their lives on the right track. But this trend towards burnout has left me with some really deep questions. Namely, why are we going this direction? What is causing this to be such a large problem across such a wide base of people? And what can we do to help shore our lives up against this rising trend so that we don't have to walk down that path at all? Now, I work for Discourse. We're a community platform and we love the people that make communities happen. And we're at community at CMX Summit this week because community management's on the rise. One thing I've seen though over time is that when a field or a profession or a company or something comes to prominence like this, often comes with that pressure. There's pressure to perform, to meet new business goals, to innovate, to drive growth, to hit metrics. And especially if you're a solo community manager and an up and coming company, it can be super easy to just let all the other areas of your, li of your life languish for a period of time while you're focusing on success if you're feeling that pressure. This is okay to do for a short period of time. We all do it. But when it's something that becomes a habit over the long term, and I think this has been a tendency for a lot of folks, that's where we enter the danger zone when it comes to burnout. So that's why I wanted to talk with you today about this subject. First, to talk about what burnout is. Second, to talk about where I've seen through both my research and observations where I think it might be coming from in our work culture and behaviors. And then to give you four strategies on how we can maybe shore our lives up uh, to stand against this and walk a much healthier path. So burnout, as defined by the WHO, is the result of chronic unmanaged stress. So chronic being consistent over a period of time, unmanaged meaning that you're not doing anything to mitigate that stress, and then stress being elevated levels of cortisol in your body. Having elevated levels of cortisol or stress is an okay thing. In fact, a lot of things that happen in our lives, it's essential to have some kind of stress, but it's when it goes unmanaged over a period of time, that's when it becomes a problem and it can manifest itself in three main ways, namely exhaustion, negativity, and then reduced productivity at work. But it doesn't end there. If we don't deal with burnout, if we are already feeling burnt out and we choose to just say, ah, I'm gonna keep pushing anyway, then we can get this whole gamut of physical, mental, and emotional issues that can arise in our lives just because we said, ah, I think I can just push through this. This is according to the Mayo Clinic here. So burnout is not something that we even want to toe the line with one bit. But if you're already feeling burnt out, it's too late. You've got to tackle it head on. You've got to dive in. You've got to make radical changes to your life. And you've got to find those stressors and eliminate or reduce them as much as possible. But if you're not feeling burnt out, where do we go next? How do we prevent ourselves from going down this path? Well, I think that starts with understanding that burnout's not the problem that we have to deal with. Many problems that we are facing in our culture and in our society today are what I would call upstream problems. And the real problem here lies upstream. It's how we think about work. It's how we act around our work. 
Let's talk about this for a second. When you see this graph, what do you think of? When I see it, I think of the concept of work-life balance. You got work perfectly balanced with life over here on the right-hand side, right? Well, a lot of times this is touted as a benefit in many of the companies that we work for, but what does this even mean? I know when I first started working for a company that said, hey, we've got great work-life balance, there's like, I, I don't even know what that looks like or what that means, but as I've dug into it in my life and for this presentation, Work-life balance really comes from this idea of the eight-hour workday. And the eight-hour workday was contrived in the industrial era to give workers eight hours for, to be at work, eight hours to be at home and to handle the things at home, and then eight hours to sleep. It yields a perfectly balanced 24-hour day, right? Well, in the mid-1950s, we made a drastic shift in the type of work that we're doing. Peter Drucker coined the term knowledge work to to describe the type of work that we're doing with information. So instead of putting our hands to something, making something that we can hand to somebody else physically, we're dealing with information. And that information then is used to make decisions or to funnel money to places, all sorts of different things that information is used for. But as time has gone on and the digital age arose, we're primarily now doing knowledge work for the majority of our fields. Community management is a form of knowledge work. The problem with knowledge work is that it drains us in different ways than physical labor does. Where physical labor, we're expending physical energy. Knowledge work, we're expending more mental and emotional energy. And so we have to factor this into the equation, which is why I think our work-life balance chart looks a little bit more like this today. It's a little out of balance. It's a little out of whack. And it's because the type of work that we're doing now doesn't necessarily line up with how we tend to think and frame about work. This whole concept of work-life balance and trying to balance the amount of time we're spending at work with the amount of time that we're spending at home doesn't really line up anymore because we're spending so much more mental and emotional energy than we were prior. If you come home mentally and emotionally drained, the question is, can you really be present with those who matter most to you or do the things that are the most important to you? I would contend it's fairly difficult to do so. Additionally, we just flat out don't take time off, at least here in America. According to a US-travel.org study in 2018, on average, American workers have seven days of PTO that are left over at the end of each year. This might seem like a lot, but pair this with the facts that most American workers get around 14 days of paid time off that they can accrue in a year, and they have to use that time off for sick leave as well. So they have to bank it and set it aside and take that time if say themselves or a loved one or someone they have to care for gets sick, we're really just not getting much time away from work. We might get a couple of days around the holidays, a week in the summertime, or we might choose to bank up our PTO and take a longer break once every two or three years. The thing is though, when we don't get a longer break from our work, we don't get the opportunity to disconnect from the day to day and then see our lives from above to see how everything fits into the bigger picture. You would think that we might be a little bit better at taking time for ourselves on a day-to-day -day basis too. Well, we almost live in a state of constant stimulation anymore, which kind of means that we don't. At work, we're dealing with an endless flurry of chat messages, emails, phone calls, and meetings, constant streams of information that are coming at us where we have to make micro decisions every single second about what to do with it. Do I need to act on this now? Do I need to reply? Do I need to ask questions? Do I need to file this for later? Do I need to put it somewhere else? Can I just let this be? Can I delete it? We're making decisions like that all the time. But then when we go home, we have all the responsibilities of everything outside of work that we need to handle. Plus we have phone calls and text messages and emails to handle. We have social media feeds, podcasts, TV shows, and movies to keep up on because a lot of times we don't wanna miss out on the social opportunities that keeping up on those things affords us as well. What happens when we don't give ourselves the ability to, um, what happens when we don't give ourselves the ability to disconnect from these things is our brains don't have the proper space to process. When we have dead space or absence of input, absence of stimulation, or at least diminished amount of that in our lives, our brains have the opportunity to process through the stressors and informations and the occurrences of the day. 
so that we don't build them up and carry them around with us all the time. Otherwise, if we do this for a consistent amount of time, we're going to end up with chronic unmanaged stress, burnout. So how do we handle this? Where do we go from here? Well, I think there are some strategies that we can implement that can give us a good foundation to live a healthier life overall. These aren't prescriptive. My idea here, my thought here is to give you a light framework that you can use to build into your life what works for you. Because there are so many ways that you can just say, well, just do this and do that. But everybody's different. Everybody processes life different. Everybody handles life differently. And so I'd like to give you something that I think could help you do that, at least give you some, some guidelines. And maybe you could figure out a way forward for yourself here too. It starts back here at the work-life balance graph. We've already discussed one thing that's wrong with this, and then that the model of work-life balance doesn't quite work with the way that we do work today. The other thing that's wrong here is that work is popped out over here separate from the rest of life. We've got all of these different things in life away from work. We've got relationships and family, romantic interests. We have hobbies, our finances, our physical, mental, and emotional health, our spiritual lives, things like that. And these all get relegated to this one blob over here, compartmentalized away from work. And often what happens is that we not only compartmentalize the two of these, but we often prioritize work above all of these things. And when we put work above everything else, everything else in our life tends to serve the purpose of work. I've noticed this in myself even. I am a personal productivity nut, but I've noticed this tendency sometimes that when I get really into something in that regard, that everything becomes about serving productivity. Well, I'm resting to be more productive. I am taking notes to be more productive. I'm doing all of these things in my life to be more productive, to do more work. But not everything in life is about work. There's so much more to life. Work is very important, but we need to find a place for it that's healthier. This is why I'm a fan of models like Zig Ziglar's Wheel of Life. The idea here is that you move from this work-elevated, compartmentalized approach to work, and then look at things from a holistic picture. You're at the center of this, and every one of the areas of your life is worth spending time, attention, and energy on. We've got career, finances, spiritual, physical, intellectual, family, and social. If one of these areas on the wheel of life is flat, so to say, or unhealthy, then your whole wheel, your whole picture of your life is unhealthy. The point here is that to have a healthy, fulfilled, and balanced life, each one of these areas has to be doing some level of health. But what's nice about this model is that it puts work in its place as one part of the bigger picture of our lives. And if we can make this shift alone, I think we put ourselves in a better position to stand against burnout. And once we've made this switch to a holistic perspective, I think one of the next most important things that we can try to focus on is building what I would call a North Star for our lives. This is a guiding value, something that you've said for a season is most important to you. This is not a goal. It's not a metric that you have to meet. It's not some action that you're trying to chase, but it's something that you said, you know, I need to build more of this in my life. And so I'm going to try to do that. Let me give you a solid example of what this is. I use a tool for my life called a yearly theme. Every year I sit down and I pick a word or a phrase that kind of describes what I guess the value is that I am pursuing for that year. For 2021, it's slowing down. So my year is the year of slowing down. What I do with that theme then once I've set it is that it allows me a quick and easy place to reference back to on a day-to-day -day basis to make decisions about how I'm conducting my life. So in 2020, I picked up extra projects. I was doing extra things outside of work because, well, I know a lot of us did that uh, during the pandemic to fill time and to try to navigate the emotional stresses of what's going on as well. But 2021 hit and I've had a few conversations with friends. The family says, you know what? I think you're doing too much. So I decided to make this year the year of slowing down. So when I'm faced with decisions about the commitments, the projects, the opportunities that come my way, I'm evaluating them by this standard, by this value that I've set for this year. 
is this helping me slow down? What this does is giving me a strong yes in my life. When I'm clear on what's most important to me, it allows me to more easily stay on track with that. But it also has given me what I would call a strong no as well. Because in the case of my yearly theme, everything that's not helping me slow down immediately gets a no. If it's speeding things up, it's staying out of my life. What this does is it allows me to build margin and set boundaries with the things that just don't line up with where I'm going right now. Now, it's really easy when we get time and space back into our lives just to fill it back up. If you've ever had an unexpected day off, you know that it can be really easy to just fill it up with stuff, maybe unintentionally that you weren't thinking about. Social media, TV shows, movies, things like that. Or maybe if you find consistent free time, that you're filling that up with, well, maybe I should just you know pick up the side project that I've wanted to do to make this side business work that I've always dreamed of having. Those are good things. But when we're trying to build a framework in our lives to mitigate the effects of burnout or to at least go down a different path than burnout, starting with those things first is not the best approach. Instead, it would be best to use the new space, the new margin that we have in our lives to at least start by building healthy habits that help to recharge us and affect the holistic picture of health in our lives. Namely, sleep, exercise, and fun. Sleep is super important to get, if you can get a consistent good night's sleep as much as able, I know um, probably many of you have young children. I know I am one of them. And either that, if you have children, you know the difficulty it is to get a good night's sleep at least early on. But as much as possible, if we can get a good night's rest, our brains can recharge, our bodies stay more physically healthy, and we're actually more able to be mentally present and handle our emotional situations as uh, in a much better level when we get a consistent good night's rest. There are tons of resources, books, podcasts, and articles, you name it out there that go in very deeply into this field of sleep if you're interested in diving more into that. Exercise is another good one, especially for knowledge workers, because I've often heard it said that when you expend yourself or when you're tired physically, or when you're tired mentally and emotionally, do something physical to recharge yourself. It can be a little intimidating to start exercise, especially if you haven't done it before. I know that's kind of been me. I've always been the kid who loves to tinker around on computers or do something in my room more creative. Uh, I never really got into exercise until I was older. And that's because I always associated exercise with intensity. This idea that I've got to bust it 30 minutes a day, five days a week at the gym to hit some goal, to lift some certain amount of weights, to hit some lap time, to you know get down to some certain body weight. But it doesn't have to be like that. Some of us are wired that way, and that's awesome. Keep pursuing that. But others of us, like myself, tend to get a little stressed out by that. Um, but instead, I've started to view exercise and health in general as a sort of lifelong pursuit. So instead of trying to hit some short-term goal, I'm saying, what can I do now that's just making a slight improvement? So for me lately, that's just been getting out and going for walks on a regular basis. A lot of times I'll go and meet with friends on a walk, but just incorporating movement into my life has been extremely recharging because it allows me to get away from a computer for one, and for two, it allows me to stay physically healthy because it also allows me to process the things on the mental and emotional side a heck of a lot better. And then lastly here, fun. Fun is usually the first things to go when things get stressful. But it's critical to keep it around because fun is just doing something for the sake of enjoying it. For me, this looks like producing music. I love sitting around on a synthesizer or a sampler and just exploring and digging into it and finding something that I enjoy to make or playing board games with my wife and with my friends. When I engage in these activities, I walk away recharged and ready to tackle the next thing in my life. So we've got some ways to get started. But again, health is a lifelong pursuit. How do we stick to it for the long term? This is where I think an intentional check-in comes in. This happens every few months, 3, 6, 12 months, whatever works best for you. But this is a time where you can spend a little bit of time working on and thinking about the holistic picture of your life. You can use the wheel of life as a way to say, okay, how is this going? 
is there anything that's out of balance here? Is there anything where it's not really going so well? And can I make some adjustments to that? Or you can use your North Star or yearly theme and say, have, am I on track with this? Or have I veered off course somewhere? The idea here is to give yourself space to reflect because progress happens not over the course of days, weeks, or even months, but progress happens in our lives over the course of years. And so for us to really build a structure of holistic health in our lives that leads us away from burnout and allows us to live a sustainable life, then we have to stay on track for a longer period of time. And an intentional check-in is one of the easiest ways that I have found that helps me do that. Because as I mentioned, it's all about building a sustainable life. Previously on this slide, I had written building a sustainable career, but then I realized that's totally opposite of what I just said earlier in the presentation, because it's not about our careers. It's about our lives. Our careers are part of our lives. And I think if we can make this holistic shift in our lives to seeing work as part of the bigger picture instead of it being prioritized and elevated above everything else, if we can make the shift to have some kind of a North Star in our lives that help us stay on track with what's most important to us, but also set boundaries with what's not important to us. If we can develop healthy habits of rest and recharge, like sleep, exercise, and building fun into our lives, and if we can create a space in our lives to intentionally connect with ourselves, intentionally to reflect and make changes about where we're going next, I really think that we can build the sustainable life and avoid going down the path of burnout altogether. That really covers things for today, but I did want to end with this here. If you have questions that aren't didn't get a chance to get covered today, or if you want to connect outside of the conference here, do shoot me an email. You can also follow me on social media and things like that too. I'm not super active there, but I do check in every once in a while. But that's it. I really thank you for uh, joining the presentation today, and I hope you found it really helpful. Justin, that was wonderful. Thank you very much. And uh, so uh, so touching in the sense that pretty much anyone who's into community or even not into community has actually experienced these things uh, recently. So um, it is great. So uh, super, super helpful. So uh, we've got a few minutes. So let's have a look at what we've got in the question and answer tab. So let's start with the one that's received the most votes. So Diane Yuan is asking, naturally in community, we refrain from disconnecting because we want to be reachable at all times and present in our communities. So how can community managers approach this uh, or shift perspectives to avoid burnout? Yeah, that's really great. Um, the one thing that comes to mind right away is to do some kind of batching. Uh, when we're engaging online, uh, a lot of times the conversation happens asynchronously. So we have a bunch of messages that pile up. Um, you know, if you're in a forum software like Discourse, you, you have responses that gather in there. And then on a daily basis, you can set aside, say, you know, hour and a half, two hours to just go through and make sure you're intentionally focusing on those things. Because I know it's oftentimes the quick switches of like, well, I, I got a new response over here. I got to handle this. Or I've got an email over here. I got to respond to this. And a chat message in Slack over here. I got to handle this. That type of context switching that happens all the time is I don't know, at least for myself, and I'm sure other people have experienced this too, it's exhausting. Uh, and so the easiest thing that I found to do is just to try to batch those actions together, to do those things in a block of time. Uh, Cal Newport is someone that I look up to a lot in regards to framing work and knowledge work. Uh, in his book, Deep Work, he talks about this concept of called time blocking. Uh, and one thing you can do is just schedule your day anywhere you've got blocks of time associated activity. So that's probably the easiest thing that I have found to do is to just batch that activity together, run through it all in one shot. If you need to do it more than once a day, set up yourself a couple of different times to do it. But uh, more than likely, people are okay if they wait, you know, for a little bit of time to get a response. The whole point is that they just want the response. Um, that's kind of the big thing. They just want to, they want to have that connection and that opportunity. If it happens a little bit later, sometimes it's usually okay. Fantastic. Thank you for that answer. And um, there was a question from Lindsay Nielsen uh, that was actually appeared on the chat first and then and now carried over to question. That is great. That's the next one 
What about the fear of taking time off, which is very real, I find, only to come back and have stacks of work to wait through? Yeah, so that is a challenging one. <laughs> uh, part of that, I think, is setting expectations. Because um, a lot of t a lot of times we just try to we get a flurry of work done before we go on vacation, uh, and then you know all this stuff happens while we're gone, and then we are just we kind of expect ourselves to just be back at a hundred percent as soon as we get back at the office. Uh, I've John Fitch, who wrote a book called Time Off, uh, he gave a talk at the uh, GitLab Remote Summit earlier this summer, and he talked about this idea of like ramping yourself up into a vacation and then back out of one. So giving yourself like grace and space, I guess, at, at the beginning and end of uh, your work time prior and uh, prior to the vacation and then after the vacation um, to, so you're not piling a bunch of work on yourself or you're giving yourself space to like recharge and catch up. It's also helpful too, if you can set expectations with maybe reports that you have, they're reporting to you, people, direct reports or management to say like, Hey, I'm going to be gone, but you know, this, this is kind of how I'm going to frame my time. I'm going to try to not be doing too much the day before. I'm just going to handle the, the light responses. And then when you come back that you're going to dedicate some time to just catching up, make sure that you're getting back in and you understand everything that's going on. Cause especially if you take a longer break, like two or three weeks of vacation, a lot can happen. <laughs> a lot can happen in the workplace in that time. So it does take some time to warm back up, to get back in the groove of things and to make sure you get your head wrapped around things. Um, to address the fear of taking a vacation thing too, um, cause I know this, this happens in some workplace cultures where it's, kind of almost frowned upon to take a vacation. And that's really unfortunate um, that that happens. I think personally, because everybody needs time off. We can't all work 100% of the time. Um, some of that is just setting expectations uh, and, and having that conversation with your boss to say like, hey, I'm doing this, you know, having it up front um, and coming at it from, you know, like a, how can we work together in this perspective type thing to make this successful instead of, um, you know, because. That's kind of the best way I was I would frame that I guess. So hopefully hopefully that's helpful. Yeah, thank you very much. So we've run out of time. Uh, it's been really really wonderful and enlightening. So um, I see that uh, uh, there's uh, there's a lot of uh, connections being made in this group. So um, uh, feel free to uh, to uh, follow Justin as he uh, suggested. So um, ask any questions. Sorry we couldn't really answer any any more. So uh, just heading over to the next session. Please uh, make sure that you share with CMX Summit Rise anything that you're sharing on social media. Justin, thank you very much. That's been wonderful. And I'm just going to stop recording and stop the session right now and see you in the next one. That's starting in the next minutes. Yeah, thank All you, everyone. Time.